and now I'll hit the go live button. We just need to spotlight as well. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this 40 Days Live event. We are glad that you are here. My name is Adele Halliday, and I serve as anti-racism and equity lead staff at the National Office of the United at the National Office of the United Church of Canada. Um, today is another opportunity for a live conversation as part of the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism. And thanks for joining us today. So leading us in conversation will be the Reverend Elkris Lemonji, who will be speaking about internalized racism. For those among you who are following on Zoom, who are on Zoom or following on Facebook, please feel free to use the chat throughout to ask questions or make comments. Uh, but first, here's a little bit of background for our conversation today. Uh, as noted, today is part of the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism. Um, uh, you can find uh, lots of stories on the website. Um, you can find written content, links to past video events, and more. Um, Al Kreese's reflection today is one, uh, it, she'll be offering a discussion today, but there's also a written conversation that she has written. So you're welcome to go to the, click on the story for her day, day 31. If you scroll down to the very bottom under download, you can pull up a PDF that has opportunities for learning, uh, faith reflections, children's stories, ideas for advocacy and a group commitment. And that format is the same for all 40 days. Um, so you're welcome to explore past ones and more are here to come. As part of the 40 days as well, we uh, there's a book of the week that's featured each and every week. Um, this week's book is called um, Reflections on Emancipation and Anti-Black Racism for Canada. Many of the contributors to this book are United Church, um, United Church people, including former moderators. And this book seeks to raise awareness about the history of African enslavement and the legacies of slavery in Canada, uh, with reflections by a number of people, not just in Canada, but around the world. If you're interested in ordering books, um, that book, among others, are available at the United Church Bookstore. The website is ucrdstore.ca, and you can get a discount if you order two or more books before November 27th, and if you use the discount code 40 days. One more thing before we introduce El Cris more fully. Uh, one, we would invite you to consider marking your calendars for an upcoming retreat day, which is scheduled for December 21st. This will be a day of contemplation on what decolonizing and anti-racism might mean for you by engaging with some of our United Church Education Centers. You'll be able to drop into a center for a few hours or be present for the day or stay overnight or join online. It will be the Five Oaks Retreat Center in Paris, Ontario, and the Tatamagush Center in Tatamagush, Nova Scotia, which are both available for in-person retreats. Uh, and as noted, there'll also be some ways to participate online. This will be an excellent opportunity to continue the learnings from the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism, and there'll be more information available in the weekly newsletter or on the website for the 40 Days. So now, on to El Cris. <laughs> Uh, to introduce Alcris, Alcris Lemunji came to Canada from Venezuela in 1996. Her experiences in different settings as a racial, quote, other, along with academic opportunities, guided her in her learnings about racism and anti-racism. She joined the United Church of Canada around 1997 and has served in many different roles as a general counsel office staff person, as a volunteer, and as a minister. Alcris is a member of the Anti-Racism Common Table and a facilitator of racial justice training. So a warm welcome to El Cris. Thank you, Adele. Good evening, everyone. Let us start by lighting a candle and uh, Brian will light a candle uh, for us in the background. And this candle is to invoke and acknowledge God's presence in our conversation. 
I invite you, if you have a candle nearby, just to light it and make it personal for someone, for some racialized person or friend that you want the light the candle for or for a specific group or as your silent prayer about the impact on racism in our BIPOC siblings in Christ. So you're invited to light your candle or feel represented by Brian's candle. So we light this candle for all who experience racism in our church, for healing, reconciliation, and for this light to illumine our path to becoming an anti-racist denomination. Amen. Thank you, Alcris, for opening our time together. Um, I shared a bit of a bio about you, but I wonder if you might also want to introduce yourself. What would you like to tell us about yourself? Well, um, my racial, uh, my ethnic profile, I, I am a mix, a mixed race. My two uh, god uh, grandparents, grandfathers, came from Europe, one from Italy, and that's my last name is Limongi, and my second last name is Ortiz, which is from Spain. And they married two Venezuelan women. One was Afro-descendant and the other one was uh, indigenous with indigenous um, heritage. So here we are, here I am, uh, a mestiza, and that means a mix of many uh, races. And I came to Canada in 1996. Um, I lived in Toronto for many years, and part of my journey has been also in the United States, serving the, the United Methodist Church um, with Hispanic, um, uh, forming beginning Hispanic ministries, and part of my journey was also to go back to Venezuela to be with my mom until she passed away. So all these experiences being here as a newcomer with no English at all, with one luggage uh, and a husband, it made me like all these experiences I have been articulating in my journey and I have made the commitment to serve the church uh, from my brown eyes, from my experience, from my perspectives and from uh, the joys and the pains that I've gone through. Um, Thank you, Alcris. Um, and how, how have you been involved in the United Church? Well, in 1996, when I came, I came as a Presbyterian and, but I met um, a, a person in the Presbyterian Church and he, his partner, he was a United Church. So they became, you know, our first friends in Canada and they gave me the book, This United Church of Ours from Ralph Milton. And it was an easy read for me. Uh, I was learning English, but I knew how to read. I didn't know how to speak. So I, I was fascinated about the picture of the laughing Jesus, about the new creed, you know, a church that could revisit and create a creed. Um, I was raised in the Roman Catholic Church, so that was um, something new for me. And for the commitment to social justice and to justice. So I, I first... I went to my first United Church that I visited was Blue Street in Toronto, and that became my home congregation and uh, until today. So um, when I, uh, at the beginning, I served the church. I don't know if you remember the division of uh, mission and outreach. I served in that community, and I have served as translator for partners visiting Canada and then um, as a candidate for ministry and doing services in the Muskokas and 
And then um, I started my uh, candidacy for ministry and studied at Emmanuel College. And then I started my PhD at Emmanuel College and I went to work at the General Council Office at Racial Justice, Gender Justice and Social and Sexual Minorities Program Coordinator. And then I'm serving as a minister in the church. Wonderful, thank you, Alcris, for sharing a bit about your United Church involvement. Uh, earlier, as you spoke about yourself, you also talked about being from Venezuela. Is there anything else that you might want to share about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I come from Venezuela and um, the values that I brought with me, that I was raised with, are family, a family that is very close, united. We uh, support each other and I, and I have brought this vision to the church. Um, I come from a family of strong professional women, hardworking, caring for others, and a strong religious faith since I was very little, going to mass with my great grandmother. So I, I served in, in North Carolina, and um, the church, that church wanted to start a Latino ministry in Raleigh. And um, I, I faced there one of the, first, the, the, the main stereotypes about my cultural group is that everybody comes from Mexico, everybody eats tacos, everybody is um, eh, undocumented. Um, also that women are not working, they stay at home with large families. They don't contribute to the workforce and, and if they do, they come to uh, steal the jobs from, from uh, people in, in the States, that was in the States. Um, so when they, this church called me, they gave me the key for the trailer in the parking lot. And they said, okay, start the Latino ministry, no? A week later, I came back to the office and I had a meeting and I said, if you want to start Latino ministry, this is part of your vision. So you need, I would invite you to learn Spanish and also to learn about the Latino culture. So we started teaching, I started teaching English and Spanish and every week they brought, they had to do a presentation about a different Latino country and we had the food from the country and it was a blast, but it, it, it really made a change because the, the ministry is, uh, is still today and they, they uh, got engaged and they were um, not only exposed, but engaged in that ministry. Yes, thanks, Alcris. Uh, you spoke a little bit about some of the stereotypes that you had, um, that you've experienced. Can, I wonder, have you ever been asked the question, where are you really from? Or are you a credit to your race? Or anything along those lines? Yes. Um, well, I have been always asked, but where are you really from? Um, but it really doesn't impact me in a bad way. I'm happy to say I'm from Venezuela, I'm a Latin American, but for many people that are born here, that they have been here for generations, that question that always comes after, you know, where are you from, but where are you really from when they don't say any country outside, for example, Japan or uh, Jamaica or Nigeria, you know, uh, it is really harmful for people. And I, I've heard, you know, like, when are we going to belong really? You know, so this is, a, you know, a well-intentioned question, but we need to think on the impact on, on people. What are we really saying? Thank you, Alcris. And um, you know, we're, today we're, we'll be talking more specifically about racism and internalized racism. Uh, mm -hmm. How much you respond when, when people say that racism is not the only form of inequity today? 
and then might mm -hmm. speak about other forms of discrimination. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would say yes and. <laughs> Uh, yes, because it is a reality, you know, there are many forms of oppression, all the isms in society, sexism, homophobia, ageism, classism, and um, all of those. But this comment is also uh, something that if we're listening, somebody talking about the racial story, about their experience, and immediately we cut that will, well, yes, I, I have been oppressed too because as a woman, you know, what we're really saying is your experience, your racial experience is not important. And, um, and detours, you know, the attention from the conversation. So that's something that happens a lot too. And we need to pay attention to those little things. It's not, it's not about to walk on eggshells, you know, uh, because we're all going to make mistakes uh, and we're going to say it wrong and we're going to learn and we're going to fall and stand up again and continue, no. But it's about, you know, listening how what we say may land in, in a situation like this. Thank you, Elkreis. Um, so today we're talking about internalized racism specifically. So mm -hmm. why did you choose to write about and talk about internalized racism? Mm -hmm. Well, because we seldom talk about this. We may focus on the justice part of anti-racism or on policies or, or exploring and understanding white privilege or the ideology of white supremacy, but we we still, I think we don't touch enough on this. And um, because racism is not something that happens on occasion every four years or this month and maybe in two months and we watch that on TV. Racism for BIPOC people is an everyday experience. And uh, we learn, you know, how many of us and learn how to cope with that, you know, to choose our battles. And, uh, and, and, and for others, it's really, really painful and paralyzing. So I think, you know, when you listen to somebody uh, saying that something similar to what you're going through is it, liberating and it's healing, you know? And also for, um, for white people, it is, I, I always think in, in relationships, in couple relationships, we have a set of expectations and we want them to act in a, a specific way and we have needs and wants as a couple, and, but we don't tell them, you know? And we have these expectations and they're wrong because they're not doing this. And so I think it's important is we have this, transparent conversations, we, we all get benefit. Because uh, for a white person, they cannot know what we feel inside. And for a BIPOC person, it could be liberating and encouraging to hear, okay, this happens not only to me. Um, However, it is not easy. Like when I share pieces of my story, it's not to victimize myself or, uh, but it's, it's making myself vulnerable when, when I talk about this. And sometimes I feel, you know, like when you put a garment uh, upside, inside out for the washer, you know, it's like putting your, uh, your life out and letting others know what you feel and how is it for you. But I think it's, it is important work. And sometimes, you know, even, and, and this is uh, the experience of many of us that after we talk, we, we, you know, we think maybe I was exaggerating or maybe, you know, I was too subjective or maybe I'm too sensitive, or maybe I was wrong, or what about my white friends? Or what about if, 
if and what about the privileges I have in society and all the ifs, you know, come to our mind. So, uh, but I still think it's, it's important to talk about this. Yeah. And the other reason is that I firmly believe that uh, to unmask and do uh, interrupt racism and to develop an anti-racism personal and denominational um, identity is not the work of only one group, you know? It's both, all of us together. And we need uh, not, you know, like, it's not us against them and I'm, I'm going to hide what I feel because it's enough, no. It's about advancing this together and developing this um, anti-racism, um, anti-racist uh, identity together. Great, thanks, Alcris. Uh, just before I ask you an, the next question, I will maybe just invite anyone who would like, uh, please feel free to write questions in the chat uh, or offer uh, comments. Uh, anything that you're hearing that you're wondering about, mm -hmm. um, you're welcome to use the chat function to please respond. Um, so back over to you, Elkris. Uh, can you share a little bit about how does internalized racism happen? Okay, um, let me show you first how racism happens. And um, Brian, could you please? Mm -hmm. uh, this is a model by um, Paul. If I will remember in a moment, his last name is starts with W, but what he uh, uh, tries to model is like racism is like um, a staircase and he calls it the staircase of oppression. And as you see, uh, the ground of the staircase is the white supremacy ideology. What does it do? It, you know, we, we don't question this is the big stories supporting um, a society. So we don't question that these are normal, uh, normalized. Um, in, in the core of this, and it's very simple, is the belief that um, the uh, white group is superior to all other groups. So everything um, is based on the concept of race uh, back in the 1500s. And, you know, that's in, in a nutshell, but that's, you know, the, the ground. And it's, it's for us, like the water um, for the fish. I, I suppose I haven't been a fish, but I suppose that the fish doesn't notice the water. You know, it's not thinking, okay, what is this? No, it's the... Uh, the uh, uh, context, uh, the environment for them. So this is the base of all these uh, steps. So the first step is stereotypes. And stereotypes are generalizations uh, about groups of people. Sometimes they have a little bit of truth and most of the time, times they don't, but they are uh, repeated and we see them in spoken and non-spoken ways in, in our everyday life. And they are not, a, for example, um, I was investigating about a, stereotypes about Canadians. And one of them is that Canadians always say A at the, at, at the last of the sentence. It is really not true, not everyone says that and not everyone puts maple syrup on everything you eat or we eat because I'm Canadian too uh, or a, the other stereotype is that Canadians are very polite uh, not all Canadians I are but well at least you have a, or Canadians have good stereotypes, <laughs> I didn't find any negative, but it doesn't happen to all the other groups. 
uh, for example, I was a, for example, for Hispanics, as I had said, you know, they have all the same origin and, and it's not true, we're three, 33 countries with different culture, different food, uh, even different music and uh, ex cultural expressions in that all, um, for example, all Latino men are uh, machistas and they, um, you know, about, they, they conduct themselves violently and, and, and there are men in our Latino countries that are not like that, that are uh, different. Um, for example, my, my dad was known as the mother, el hombre madre, the mother man because he was with me all the time, all everywhere, even to school, he brought me and put me <laughs> beside his um, desk. So that's a stereotypes. And stereotypes, when we stop questioning that, uh, those, and they become, our, they become part of our belief system and of, and of our views. And when, we assimilate that, and that's, for example, what is called internalized racism. So all that we hear about us, all the messages, verbal and non-verbal, that minimize us, that make us invisible, that um, ascribe our intelligence because of the way we speak, uh, and that happens to many uh, groups or um, the when we the minoritized group start believing that we are internalizing that racism and why because that's supported by the ideology by um, the water in which we live so when those stereotypes that we accept as a true uh, become prejudices and they become a, a way that in which we prejudge other people and other groups. And when we enact on that, that becomes discrimination. And when discrimination is supported by that white supremacist ideology, like uh, it normalizes and okays that, that becomes racism or any oppression actually, but we're focusing on race right now. So this is how it happens. So when we stop questioning those prejudices about ourselves, when we feel ashamed of being discriminated, like if there is a reason for us, if there is something wrong with us. Um, I remember one time I was very new uh, here and I went to one of those uh, women's retreats that were done in Waterloo. And I went to the registration table and I asked a question. I don't remember the question, but I was responded like, and who are you? You know, like, who are you here? You know, who are you? But it was that who are you that I felt um, ashamed and I felt that I didn't belong there. I remember I went to the washroom and I really, really wanted to have my hair short and blonde. Um, I could survive the rest of the uh, retreat, but that was a shock. You know, there, there's some experiences that really mark our lives. And, um, and so we start feeling um, a different and we start feeling we are the other. And um, so, some people uh, uh, just um, assimilate, assimilate that and internalize that and get paralyzed or resentful. Others just get away from their uh, racial group uh, or ethnic group because they're ashamed and they want to assimilate to the dominant group. So there is a whole continuum. continuum. But um, basically the 
uh, internalized racism is when we um, start uh, to believe and to accept and to enact based on the racism that we experience in society or personally as microaggressions. So let us try um, an exercise. And uh, Brian, can you show the next slide, please? Mm -hmm. Let's do an exercise. It's called Mattering and Marginality. Uh, we did this in the United Church when we, in 2012, the first time with Beth Symes, she was the facilitator. And uh, we used that for the LGBTQ consultations at the time. But it's a very uh, experiential and important exercise. So I'm going to ask you to think of a time when you felt that you matter that you feel welcome, important, necessary, that you belong, bonded, because of the role you were playing or because of your gender or your race. Try to recreate that moment in your mind. So I'm going to ask you to think about three things. How did you know that you matter? For example, what external signs, what nonverbal language, what words or what actions, how did you know inside of you that you matter? Because not, not always we, we are told you are important or no, but how did you remember that you knew that you mattered? The second question is, how did you feel? What emotions evoke your emotions? And stay here for a moment. Did you feel happy, completed? I, I don't know. Um, the third one is how did you behave when you felt that you mattered in that context? So how did you know, how did you feel, and how did you behave? Let us have a couple of minutes while you think that. So I'm gonna go again through the first question and ask you to write in the chat, how did you know that you matter? Like what external signs or nonverbal language or words and actions? We don't need to talk about the, the situation, just try to give me um, some ideas about the external signs Positive words and actions, smiles, yes. Thank you, Virginia. Remembered my name, yes. I got positive feedback. There was a place at the table for me. Yes, invited and welcome. People listen, share examples of similar situations and an email was sent and brought to my attention. Words of appreciation, very, very welcome, smile, answered my questions. Thank you so much. So those are external signs. And how did you feel? Just at least one emotion. How did you feel? Caroline says, welcoming smiles, welcoming actions. Yes, thank you. And how did you feel? Appreciated valued, happy, complete, accepted, excited, noticed, cared for, validated, perfect, secure, valued, in warm and fuzzy, yes, felt competent, yes. How did you behave? Is the third question. How did you behave when you felt um, important and competent and appreciated and welcome. How did you behave in that context? Confidently, relaxed, yes. So 
talk to others, look them in the eye. Yes. Excellent. Confident, willing to share, very happy. Engaged, open to share, spoke easily. Um, okay, one more. Okay. Okay. So we have that idea. We can feel, you know, we can anchor in, in our minds and in our body those feelings when we feel that we matter. Um, Brian, normal. Um, could you please go to the next? Uh -huh. uh, now, uh, the next part is marginality. Think of a time when you felt marginalized, for example, dismissed or voiceless or invisible or discriminated against and retrieve again from your memory the feeling of marginalization. It could be even when you were a child or at work or at church or store traveling. So the three questions again are the same. How did you know that you were marginalized? What messages did you get? Ignored, invisible, I was called names, yes. That's, that's a very powerful message. Um, how did you feel and how did you act? So dismissed, not included, ignored. Mm -hmm. Compared, yes. My suggestions were ignored, depressed, felt small and embarrassed. Yeah. little people step in front of me as if I weren't there, yes. Sad, not worthy, and important, nervous. And how did you act? Became quiet. Silent. Shocked. Disengage and withdraw, withdrawn, yes. Wanted to leave. Mm -hmm. Felt annoyed, unable to speak. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing that wordless, yes. Thank you. Angry, yes. Yeah. And not willing to participate. Yeah, there is a range of emotions that um, we experience in both cases, when we feel that we matter and when we feel that we don't, when we feel that we're welcome and when we are just imposing our presence or basically we're invisible. Um, I'm going, we're going to play a video that, um, or Adele, do you have anything to say or can I continue? No, let's continue. Let's watch the video, please. Oh, oh, Thanks, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay. This is a video that I want to warn you before. Uh, it was in the sixties. It was, this exercise was done by a third grade teacher in the States the day after that um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. He, she wanted to talk in, uh, with her class and, um, and for them to understand what was happening. Um, in, in their context. So uh, please be mindful that the historic distance, there is language that is used there that it was for you know, 50 years um, ago. And um, also the methodology, you might find that is a strong as well, but you know, try to pass that a, first reaction of, you know, panic or shock or anger 
and go into the experience. Um, I think it's, it's very um, illuminating for us in this conversation of, of um, internalized racism. So, um, Brian, could you please play the video? This is a special week. Does anybody know what it is? National Brotherhood. Brotherhood. National Brotherhood Week. What's brotherhood? Treat everyone as though he was your brother. brother. And is there anyone in this United States that we do not treat as our brothers? Yes. Who? Yes. The, the, black black people. People. the black people. Who else? Indians. Absolutely the Indians. Many places in the United States. How are black people treated? How are Indians treated? How are people who are of a different color than we are treated? They, they don't get anything in this world. Why is that? Because they're different color. You think you know how I would feel yeah. to be judged by the color of your skin? I don't. Do you think you do? No, I don't think you'd know how that felt unless you had been through it, would you? It might be interesting to judge people today by the color of their eyes. Would you like to try this? Yeah! Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Since I'm the teacher and I have blue eyes, I think maybe the blue-eyed people should be on top the first day. I mean, the blue-eyed people are the better people in this room. Uh -oh. oh, yes, they are. Yeah. Blue-eyed people are smarter than brown-eyed people. This is a fact. The brown-eyed people do not get to use the drinking fountain. You'll have to use the paper cups. You brown-eyed people are not to play with the blue-eyed people on the playground. Well, the brown-eyed people in this room today are going to wear collars so that we can tell from a distance what color your eyes are. You ready, Laurie? She's brown-eyed. She's a brown-eyed. You'll begin to notice today that we spend a great deal of time waiting for brown-eyed people. I don't see the yardstick to you. It's coming over there. Hey, Mrs. Lake, you better keep that on your desk. Let the brown-eyed people get out of hand. Oh, you think if the brown-eyed people get out of hand, that would be the thing to use. Who goes first to lunch? Blue -eyed. The blue-eyed people. Blue-eyed people may go back for seconds. Brown-eyed people do not. Brown -eyed. Don't you know? Oh, they're not smart. <laughs> And it seemed like when we were down on the bottom, everything bad was happening to us. The way they treated you, you felt like you didn't even want to try to do anything. It seemed like Mrs. Elliott was taking our best friends away from us. What happened at recess? Were two of you boys fighting? Russell called me names, and I came in the gut. What did he call you? Brown eyes. They always call us that. Yeah. yeah. They always call us that. They call us brown eyes. What's wrong with being called brown eyes? It means that we're stupid. I watched what had been marvelous, cooperative, wonderful, thoughtful children turn into nasty, vicious, discriminating little third graders in a space of 15 minutes. Yesterday, I told you that brown-eyed people aren't as good as blue-eyed people. That wasn't true. I lied to you yesterday. The truth is that brown-eyed people are better than blue-eyed people. Russell, where are your glasses? I forgot them. You forgot them, and what color are your eyes? Blue. <laughs> Susan Ginder has brown eyes. She didn't forget her glasses. Yeah. Russell Ring has blue eyes, and what about his glasses? He forgot them. He forgot them. <laughs> Yesterday we were visiting, and Greg said, Boy, I like to hit my little sister as hard as I can. That's fun. What does that tell you about blue eyed people? <laughs> the brown eyed people may take off their collars, and each of you may put your collar on a blue eyed person. The brown-eyed people get five extra minutes of recess. You blue-eyed people are not allowed to be on the playground equipment. You blue-eyed people are not to play with the brown-eyed people. Brown-eyed people are better than blue-eyed people. They are smarter than blue-eyed people. And if you don't believe it, look at Brian. I use Orton Gillingham phonics. We use the card pack. The brown-eyed children were in the low class the first day, and it took them five and a half minutes to get through the card pack. The second day, it took them two and a half minutes. The only thing that had changed was the fact that now they were superior people. You went faster than I ever had anyone go through the card pack. Why couldn't you get them yesterday? We had the collars on. You think the collars kept you? We just keep thinking about those collars. Oh, 
and you couldn't think as well with the collars on. Four minutes and 18 seconds. How long did it take you yesterday? Three minutes. Three minutes. How long did it take you today? Four, four, four minutes and 18 seconds. seconds. What happened? One down. What were you thinking of? This. I hate today. How do you do? I hate too. <laughs> because I'm blue-eyed. See, I am too. Mm -hmm. There's nothing, it's not funny, it's not fun, it's not pleasant. This is a filthy, nasty word called discrimination. We're treating people a certain way because they are different from the rest of us. Is that fair? No. 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 Nothing fair about it. We didn't say this was going to be a fair day, did we? No. no. And it isn't. It's a horrid day. Okay, you ready? What did you people who are wearing blue collars now find out today? I know what yeah. they felt like In yesterday. The... I did too. Uh, How did they feel yesterday? Down. Like a dog on a leash. Yeah. Like you're chasing them out up into prison. Like you're shut yeah. up and you're throwing the key away. Should the color of some other person's eyes have anything to do with no. how you treat them? No. no. All right, then should the color of their skin? No. no. Should you judge people no. by the color no. of their skin? No. no. When you see a black man or an Indian or someone walking down the street, are you going to say, <laughs> look at that silly looking thing? No. no. Does it make any difference whether their skin is black or white? No. Or yellow? No. Or red? No. Is that how you decide whether people are good or bad? No. Makes people good or bad. No. Now you know a little bit more than you knew yeah. at the beginning of this week. Yeah. Yes. Okay, now are you back? Yeah. Yes. Does that feel better? Yeah. Yes. Does the color of eyes that you have make any difference in the kind of person you are? No. Thank you, Brian. Um, my reading of the exercise is that she uses a physical feature to divide the glass, something that is visible, the eyes. And we observe how difference divide the group and assigns worth and privilege to one group over the other. And uh, it is interesting to watch that the group, the superior group doesn't question their privilege. They just take it and develop a sense of superiority. And she says that in just 15 minutes, the dynamic change. And that's part of what we saw in the stairs of opp oppression. In, in this case, the authority um, or the power of being, she makes it normal and systemic. So they don't hesitate to see the other group as dumb, less than, stupid, and call them names. And the other group to feel and internalize and absorb all of that. Um, the, the brown eyed kids um, were aware that of their color, they, their color, they said they couldn't perform even, you know, the exercise with the cards, you know, because they were thinking about the color. In some of the comments, they said that they didn't want to do anything, it's, you know, like depression or frustration, that everything bad happens to them. And this is the impact of systemic racism. For example, if a police car stops a black man, and if we go to a medical or a store counter, and we, we usually, and I, I'm not standing here to represent BIPOC people, but even I, uh, when I go, um, I, I wonder, you know, what type of treatment I will get. Sometimes it's not nice. And sometimes the nonverbal expression, uh, when you know some people hear an accent, uh, it, it changes the dynamic. So it took um, for these kids uh, more than a double of the time to perform that little ex exercise with cards. And they were thinking that they were dumb and they were internalizing what it was told to them what they were. So they, 
when the, the colors were taking off, they flourished again. And I, I noticed how uh, when they are debriefing on uh, day three, they're all embracing each other. And when I first watched it, I felt really bad because Jane Elio uh, exposed the children to the realities of racism. But I was thinking that we do the same. We expose our children to things like that. They're exposed every day. So um, I want for us uh, to hear a little bit more from Jane Elliott in an interview 50 years later. She continued to do this work, not with her class, but she started with teenagers, then adults. And there is a video and when she did that in an Oprah Winfrey show. She divided the audience, they didn't know, and it is, it's interesting to watch. So Brian, could we please um, play this one? Yes. Well, I said, if I, were, if I were black, they'd have killed me a long time ago. And if I were black and saying the things I say, I, I wouldn't be alive. Bullshit. No, you're not going to say I'm sorry there's racism. No, I do not have to ask you nicely. I consider this exercise an injection of the live virus of racism. I watched my students become what I told them they were. I watched little wonderful brown-eyed white people become vicious, ugly, nasty, discriminating, domineering people in the space of 15 minutes. I watched brilliant little blue-eyed white Christian children become timid and frightened and angry and unable to learn in the space of 15 minutes. If you do that with a whole group of people for a lifetime, you change them psychologically. You convince those who are analogous to the brown-eyed people that they are superior, that they are perfect, that they have the right to rule. Did you learn anything this morning? I think I learned from the experience of feeling like I was in a glass cage and I was powerless. I realized this morning that there are very few times in my life that I've ever been discriminated against, very few. And you convince those who take the place of the blue-eyed students, that they are less than. How did they feel yesterday? Down like a dog on a leash. If you do that for a lifetime, what do you suppose that does to them? You find out that there are people of color who refuse to live down to our expectations of them. I am now watching, at the national level, that exercise that I did based on eye color being reenacted in the government of the United States of America. I've done this with people of all ages for the last 50 years. Now think about that. Next year it will be the 50th anniversary of the killing of Martin Luther King Jr. and the beginning of the Blue Eyed Brown Eyed exercise. When are we going to learn? When are we going to put a stop to this? White people's number one freedom in the United States of America is the freedom to be totally ignorant about those who are other than white. We live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. White people are the free and people of color have to be brave. I want this situation to change. I want it to be such that no black person has to have courage to get up in the morning any more than I, as a white person, have to have courage to get up in the morning. This is the most important book you or I or anybody else will ever read. I'm an educator. Every educator should refuse to perpetuate the myth of white superiority. There's only one race. It's the human race. Yes, one race, the human race is it's also something that people uh, use to detour that to avoid, okay, I don't see race, there is only one race. But we know that that's true because the concept of race was recently invented in the last centuries. So we believe that there is only 
one race, but still the myth of um, the superiority of one race is still alive. And not only here, but all around the world, provoking divisions, self-inflicted pain, societal discrimination, bullying, hatred, systemic abuse, unfair policies, ignorance, and killings. Adele? Yes, thank you, Elkris. In leading us in conversation today about internalized racism, what are you hoping that people will learn or some of the takeaways for people today? Well, I think a conversation about race is, has always the potential of healing, um, regardless of the color of your skin. Um, I, I hope that this conversation might be the beginning of a healing for somebody or a reconciliation or a validation or new ways to understand others and their experiences. And I hope that bring, bring light, like the candle we lit, um, to our eyes and really look for ways to understand more or, or engage uh, deeper into achieving racial justice. Um, for BIPOC people, I, from my experience, sometimes it is difficult. I not all the time. I go through experiences that are really painful, but um, I, I would recommend, you know, as in John chapter 17, when Jesus washed the feet of the disciples to wash your feet every night in journal or pray or uh, review what messages are a, hurting you from your experience during your experiences during the day. For me, it really helps to talk uh, with somebody. Um, and um, one important allyship work that you can do is to be a good listener, you know, for other people. I have white people are very good friends of mine and I we can have the trust of listening to each other. Um, also, a, I think it's important to continue, you know, to learning and unlearning, you know, these microaggressions, like we face systemic racism, and on the other hand, there are daily microaggressions that BIPOC people go through every day, small, like being followed in, in a store, or being uh, not attended uh, at a counter in the same way, or at, uh, or first when you're waiting in line and you know uh, someone give preference to other, or even um, I I remember my first Canada day that I I was so excited uh, to go to a. Uh, in, in Toronto to City Hall and I was wearing, you know, my Canadian flag and all of that. And from time to time, you know, I saw uh, elevator, elevator looks, you know, like look to you like, who are you, you know, <laughs> or, you know. Uh, so, you know, there are little things that uh, we go through a lot. And uh, it is important to know that those things wait on us. And for BIPOC people, um, yeah, to, to use our experiences and continue the journey to, to work together, you know, and if you need to sit and rest, by all means, take a rest, but continue because this is, it's not easy, but I believe we can, we can do it together. Thank you, Elkris. Um, were there some additional reflections that you wanted to share about uh, Romans 12? Yes, um, one of the scripture passages, and I think this is important also with the kids, is to provide them um, 
a different way of, of looking at themselves and the world. Um, Romans 12, and Brian, please. <laughs> Says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So, I now understand that offering my body as a living sacrifice every day, it means to offer my eyes, my ears, my mouth, my heart, my hands, my feet, uh, to serve others, to listen to others, to be attentive, and especially regarding racism, because we're focusing on that right now, to, to notice what the things that God will would want us to notice and to renew our mind um, to not conforming, but to renewing. And that's where transformation happens in the cleansing of our hearts from everything that hinder us uh, to, to live in right relations with one another and to transform our, our minds, to, to continue learning and unlearning. And especially that transformation comes from listening to one another. Thank you, Elkreis. Uh, I'm just going to put a few links in the chat um, before we, uh, I ask you maybe one final question to close off our time. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there's a link for the, the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism for the main page to, um, find the stories from any of the days, including Al Crease's written reflection. Um, this day's video is being recorded along with all the other days, um, all the other 40 days live events, and they're all available on the United Church's YouTube page. And finally, there are, um, of course, some books that are available from the United Church bookstore. Uh, if you order two more books, you get a discount of 20% uh, before. November 27th. So the link is ucrdstore.ca. So all of those are available to you um, as participants for the 40 days. So again, thank you for being here today. Um, Alcris, I wonder if you can close off our time by maybe responding to one more question. And of course, anyone can continue to write uh, comments, questions in the chat as people have mm -hmm. been doing so far. Uh, so maybe the last question for you, Alcris, is Having had this conversation, what is one commitment or one way of doing advocacy about internalized racism that people could be encouraged to do, that people could be encouraged to be engaged in? Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes when we think about internalized racism, um, we may think that this is um, something like we, we judge, we may judge. Um, BIPOC people for internalizing those thoughts and, and see that as a sign of um, a debilidad, <laughs> uh, the opposite of strength, a weakness, yes, as a weakness. But we don't see the whole picture, the systemic, uh, the, 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 we're all human. You know, if you hear since you're born that you're perfect, that you're good, that, you know, uh, you, you develop a different way, a different attitude. So um, I hope that tonight that opens a new, a little bit of more, the window to understand the experiences of BIPOC people. And I hope that BIPOC people feel that, it, you know, I, that you're not weak or you're not crazy or no, it is, this is the system or this is the water we live in. So one commitment could be uh, just to listen, to pay attention, to try to keep in mind the, the big picture. Um, it could be to develop an interracial relationship, uh, for example, 
Brian and I developed one many years ago when we had the trust of having these difficult conversations um, about race and about, um, yeah, internalized racism and also uh, experiences of racism when we uh, started, started doing this work together. So make up, you know, or, or one small commitment for today related directly to internalize racism. Maybe you can watch more of these videos and see the, the impact of the words we are told about who we are and what is your, uh, what our worth. Um, or when you are out and about, pay attention how a, a racialized person is treated differently than you are. Um, and when there is lots of grace in God to help us to continue this beautiful journey that we are embarked in. So thank you for being with me tonight. And um, thank you, Adele, for inviting me. Thank you, El Cris, for engaging us in conversation this evening and for leading us in a discussion about internalized racism. Um, and for engaging us in video conversations and we cannot hear you. No. Okay. Hello. Thank you, Barb. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, just offering words of thanks. So thank you to Al Crease. Apologies for the technical difficulties. So thank you to Al Crease for leading us in conversation today for a discussion, um, for engaging us in this conversation around internalized racism and the videos and conversation and chat. So thank you very much for this time. And thank you all. You're and you're welcome to stay for a few minutes in case you wanted to add additional things to the chat. And thank you once again, everyone for being here today. Thank mm -hmm. you.